Well, good morning. It's always good when you're invited back. Well, and it's also always hard when following Pastor Stefan. I mean, he just, he just brings it. Praise God, huh? I love my brother. By the way, you could also just be praying for him. Um, he's, I think, moving at some point soon, uh, October, November, somewhere around there. So just, just keep him in your prayers as well. Um, but we're going to be going through, just continuing our series through the book of Colossians. And so if you have your Bibles, you can turn to Colossians We're in chapter 2. We're going to be covering verses 6 through 15 this morning. And I am going to read. And just as a reminder, this is the word of God. So then, just as you have received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to walk in him, being rooted and built up and established in the faith, just as you were taught and overflowing with gratitude. Be careful that no one takes you captive, though philosophy and empty deceit based on human tradition, based on the elements of the world rather than Christ. For the entire fullness of God's nature dwells bodily in Christ, and you have been filled by him, who is head over every ruler and authority. You were also circumcised in him with a circumcision not done with hands, by putting off the body of flesh in the circumcision circumcision of Christ. When you were buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. And when you were dead in trespasses and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive with him and forgave us all our trespasses. He erased the certificate of debt with its obligations that was against us and opposed to us and has taken it away by nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and disgraced them publicly. He triumphed over them in him. Let me pray for us. Father God, I do thank you, Lord, for this day today, Lord, that you've appointed for us. I thank you, Lord, for your word, which springs forth just truth. Uh, it shows us how to live, how to think about the world and our circumstances. I thank you so much, Father God, for sending your son, Jesus, to die for us and who nailed our sins to the cross. Oh, Lord, such truth that we need today, Lord, as we, we struggle with our own sin I pray, Father God, everyone would hear, would know that they are forgiven by what you've done and just have an overflowing gratitude to you. I thank you so much, Lord. We pray that this service would just glorify you, Lord, more of you, less of me. We thank you, Father God, and pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So in verse 6, he he just starts off and he says, So then, just as you have received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to walk in him, being rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, just as you were taught and overflowing with gratitude. Just as you have received, just as you have accepted Christ. I mean, Paul here is talking about born-again believers, People who are regenerate, and he's encouraging them to continue in the faith, continue to walk in Christ. But what exactly does that mean? What exactly does that look like for us Christians? I think this is something that maybe we don't think about as Christians. Most of us have been believers for some time. You may have repented and accepted Christ maybe 40, 50, 60, 70 years ago, maybe more, maybe less. For myself, it was in 2005. I was in my late 20s. But this is one of the first marks of living a Christian life, is repenting and accepting Christ. But it is more than that also. There's more in view here. It's more than when we just first heard the gospel, the good news of the grace of Christ and how he died on our behalf. It's more than that. It's the good tradition that was passed on, 
that Jesus shared with his disciples, the apostles, and then they shared it to the next uh, generation, and even to Epaphras, who then shared it with those at Colossae, who shared the gospel. They, and then they received Christ as their Lord and as their Savior. That's the first mark, so accepting Christ. The second mark of living a Christian life is that we should be rooted in him. I want you to picture for a moment an oak tree. Oak trees are native to Maryland, so you've probably passed many of them. Even if you don't, aren't familiar with them, you've probably passed them. But oak trees, among other trees, are known for their deep roots. Some of the oak trees, their roots go 20 feet down. That is quite astonishing if you think about it. 20 feet down. I don't know if you've heard about the pando tree. Anyone heard about the pando tree? I'd never heard of it until I was studying this. But the pando tree is uh, in south central Utah, and its roots are not known for going deep. Its roots are known for spreading out 106 acres out. So you've got the oak tree that goes deep, the pando tree that goes wide with its roots. And as Christians, our roots should likewise go not only just deep, but go wide. And this means that our hearts, our minds, and our souls should be involved. Our hearts mean that we love God, we love others. And there should be a deep and wide love. We should know our neighbors, their, their names, and what they do for a living. Sharing the gospel with them so that they too, like Epaphras did with those at Colossae, they too might accept Christ. Our minds, meaning, although we don't need a degree in Bible, we should have some understanding of theology. We should understand what we believe as Christians, what we believe as Southern Baptists, and why we believe it. I went to Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. Great school. I earned my MDiv there. But I can tell you what, if they taught something that was contrary to Scripture, I'd have to reject it. Because ultimately, Scripture comes above that. But we should know what we believe as Christians and as Southern Baptists. There's a book I read at one point in my studies uh, by a pastor, uh, R.C. Sproul. He wrote a book entitled, Everyone's a Theologian. You say, I'm not a theologian, Pastor Kevin. I've never really studied Scripture. But he, in his book, he argues that if you have a viewpoint on Jesus, if you have a viewpoint on hell, if you have a viewpoint on end times, whatever it is, that you are a theologian. Even the atheists and agnostics have a view on these things, and they are theologians. I would disagree with their theology, of course. I believe in Christ and Scripture. But everyone is indeed a theologian. And we as Baptists, we believe, and among other things, we believe in baptism by immersion, believer's baptism. We believe that we're engaging in theology when we believe stuff like that. We are. But even again, atheists, agnostics, they are all theologians. But we need to know what we believe. We need to know why we believe it. We're called to be Bereans, as uh, Acts says, to understand Scripture, to examine the Word of God. And you should be examining what I am saying. And if, if what I'm saying and what I'm preaching is contrary to Scripture, then you need to say something. You all need to know what Scripture says, to examine what the preacher says and examine it. The knowledge of God, though, it affects our faith and our practice, and it shapes how we're called to love God and love others. But not only is our walk as Christians to be rooted in him, we are to be built up in him, the scripture says. We, as Christians, are built up in Christ. Think about this. Think about the, your, your house, or maybe you live in a ranch. Okay, think, maybe think, if you live in a ranch, think about someone else's house that has two stories. What was their second story built on? Built on top of the first one. And as Christians, we have Christ as our cornerstone. And upon him, everything else is built. This is the only way there is. But the, all this talk about building, and two weeks ago when I was here preaching, we had talked about you know, bearing fruit. And there's this idea here of, of growing. 
growing in Christ. And the only way we can grow into, in Christ is to know him, know his word, to depend on him. There is a, a little bit of a caution here, though, church, that I want to share with you, is that as Christians, we cannot be built up in Christ and not be growing. If we're being built up in Christ, that means we grow in Christ. It's simply not just, I'm simply not just meaning about numbers, okay? We're not talking about numbers here, but just, we're talking about just our love and our depth and our, the wideness of our depth of love for God and for others. That should always be growing, increasing. I'm talking about spiritual maturity here. We're talking about sanctification. Living the Christian life means we grow in Christ. We know him more, we love him more, we love others more. We, by the way, we can definitely, we could seek, uh, seek out intellectualism. We can seek out biblical knowledge. But are we growing in the application of that knowledge? I have a friend who, Jeannie, you guys may have heard this story before I shared this before, but... I have a friend, dear friend, who has the entire book of Acts memorized. I mean, wow. I don't even remember what I had for breakfast yesterday morning. They've got the entire book of Acts memorized. That is absolutely incredible to me. It's to be commended that they have that memorized. It's not an easy thing for sure. It took a lot of time to memorize the entire book. But is that translating into growth? Are we applying that to our lives? Are we applying what we know to be true about Scripture to our very hearts, our own hearts, where it changes us to be more Christ-like? The third element, though, of living this Christian life is where the Christian life is marked by being established in the faith or being established in understanding. A Christian life should be marked by our knowledge of the Lord. And then let me just say this. I don't think that knowledge of the Lord will ever end. (laughs) And if you think you know all there is to know about the Lord, I would just like to challenge you, brothers and sisters. We will never fully understand the things of the Lord. One of my favorite parts of the book of Job is towards the end. You know, Job, if you don't know the story, Job was, he just, everything was taken from him, right? I'm sure you know the story. Everything was taken from him. At the end, he kind of starts questioning God. And God says, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Job, you don't know my plans. You don't know these things. We can never know, fully know, the depth of God and the love that he had for us. I mean, he died on our behalf. We understand it on one level, but I don't think we could ever fully grasp the depth of that, what he's done for us. And this doesn't mean that we should ever stop getting to know him more and more and better and better and seek to continue to rely on him more and more as we look to him. In Christian life that is marked by receiving Christ, growing in Christ, and in understanding what life is about it overflows with this thanksgiving. When we, when we start to grasp that stuff, it just overflows with thanksgiving for what he has done. This is exactly what Paul had prayed about earlier on in the book of Colossians. In verse 12 of chapter 1, we see that the Christian life is a life filled with faith and thankfulness for what Christ has done. But he does, he does kind of issue a little bit of a warning to the believers. Look at verse 8. It says, be careful that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deceit based on human tradition, based on the elements of the world rather than Christ. You know, he's, he's here, he's just issuing this reminder to believers who are walking in Christ and tells them that there's a potential risk here, believers. And the risk is of potentially being taken captive. The image is clear that we are, as Christians, at risk of being on a milk carton. Now, by the way, I don't think they do that anymore, but I think you get the picture. 
There are things in the world that will try to kidnap us, kidnap our beliefs, and hold us and our beliefs hostage. I, I think Pastor Stefan had mentioned uh, Gnosticism, I think his first week that he preached here. And that was very rampant. Gnosticism is this idea that only through attaining secret knowledge can people uh, attain salvation and overcome the world. This is one method that the world uses to entice us, to believe what it believes, to hold us captive. But I believe Paul has something greater in mind, and he in fact points to something greater here, which is that any teaching, any system of thought, which does not have Christ at its center, will try to lure us away. It'll try and take us captive. So we need to examine everything by the foundations of which our faith is built on, which is Christ. As a pastor, uh, one of a pastor's duties is to guard the flock, which means uh, that we shouldn't tolerate, as a pastor, any kind of false teaching, whether it's in the pulpit or you know, even elsewhere. False doctrines, false beliefs. And, and it truly saddens me as a pastor when I sometimes I'll, I'll turn on the TV or radio and I'll, I'll hear someone preaching, claiming to preach Jesus and yet teach a prosperity gospel, right? If you only have enough faith, you wouldn't be sick. That's nonsense. How about this one? Maybe you've heard of this gospel, the good person gospel. Have you heard about this one? As long as you're a good person, you're going to go to heaven. Based on some sort of scales. Maybe you don't struggle with that one. How about the self-esteem gospel? If you believe in yourself enough, you can make it happen. Or maybe there's the expressive individualism gospel, which says, follow your heart just live your best life now. Do whatever makes you happy. The Jesus optional gospel, which says there are many ways to get to heaven. Just believe whatever you want to believe. You'll get there. How about the faith and gospel, which says you need faith and good works and something else, whatever it is, tithing, church attendance, or maybe it's the faith so gospel, which says you could live how you want to live because in the end, we're saved. And Christ doesn't care about how you're in sin today. The political gospel, that's been a hot topic over the last several years, I would say. You align with a certain political party and you think this person is going to save us. He's going to save our country and by the way, I'm, I'm, I'm an equal opportunist here. I've seen it on both political aisles. That person is surely not going to save us, whoever it is. The gospel of self-determinism, which says I can love who I want to love. I can choose any kind of sexual orientation I want to identify as. Man, is this in our culture today or what? Maybe it's the God is love only gospel. By the way, God is definitely love, but not apart from his wrath, not apart from his, his, his idea of justice, his holiness. By the way, there are plenty of others, plenty of other gospels that might take us away from the one and true gospel of Christ. But this should give you an indication of what we are up against as Christians in our society in which we live. And these things are more, and there are more and more of these things that will attempt to kidnap us and attempt to take our faith captive. And this is the real danger, I think, for those at Colossae and for, for us here today. The real danger is that these gospels aren't according to Christ, and they are, in fact, no gospel indeed. These things aren't the gospel that Epaphras shared with them. It's not the full and complete gospel that even Jesus, when he lived, that he shared. 
any human thoughts about the world and how we view it, any human thoughts about how we do ministry as Christians or as a church are all empty if they fail to grasp the significance of Christ. And specifically, what Christ taught about his own death on the cross. Man, what a warning to us, church. Huh? But this warning, it does come with a teaching. Look what Paul says next in verse 9 to 10 about the key to walking in Christ, being built up in Christ, being established in Christ, not being adopted, adopted taken captive, and other philosophies. This is how Paul describes it from verse 9. He says, for the entire fullness of God's nature dwells bodily in Christ. You have been filled by him who is the head over every ruler and authority. Paul tells us to focus on three important truths here. That God dwells in Christ, that we have been filled with Christ, and Christ is head over everything. So this means that if we are kidnapped by ideas that move us away from Christ or we are taken captive by those things, then we are in fact taken away from God. Any and every philosophy, uh, tradition that is not centered on Christ and fully established in him is empty deceit, the word says. It's vanity, no matter how great it may sound no matter how appealing it may be. And in terms of the Christian life, every sermon, every Bible study, every outreach event, every fellowship event, every business meeting, everything needs to be measured on this fundamental idea that it should be centered on Christ, the cornerstone. But not only does Christ dwell with us, but we have been filled with Christ. Another way of saying it would be that In Christ, we have been brought to fulfillment. My mind is blown. (laughs) We are fulfilled in Christ, saints. We've been fulfilled in the wholeness of God. And therefore, because of that, because we are filled in Christ, we need to take care to not be taken captive by these vain philosophies and thoughts, other ideas, let me assure you, church, that if you're struggling with this, you are not alone. We all struggle with this. I struggle with this. We all have idols in our lives. Things that we love, even if it's for a moment, things that we love above our love for Christ. One commentator, he put it very succinctly. He said it this way. He said, when you move away from Christ, no matter what you are promised, you lose. (laughs) I like that. But not only does God dwell in Christ, not only have we been filled with Christ, but Christ is head over all. No power, no authority, no philosophy, no thought is higher than Christ. It cannot rival Christ. No human tradition, no values that we have, no insight that we might have can compare to Christ. They, in fact, are empty deceits. I want to take a moment and share another story with you. As I had mentioned earlier, I came to Saving Knowledge and Faith in Christ. Uh, It was 2005, my late 20s. I had started, at that time, uh, earning my master's degree in social work. My undergraduate degree was in psychology. And so it was a kind of a natural progression for me to get my master's degree in social work. And it was about maybe, I don't know, a year or so into getting this degree when I accepted Christ. And I realized that almost everything they were teaching me was contrary to Scripture. It was contrary to Scripture, contrary to Christ. Man. We need to be on guard against being taken captive besides anything besides Christ. And he is superior to all. He's he's head over all. And when we are in Christ, we are in him, and we see that in him all things are created. In him all things hold together. The fullness of God dwells in Christ. Christ is superior. And in him we are presented perfect and mature. Boy, I like those verses, huh? I like that thought, being presented perfect and mature. 
And in him all treasures of wisdom and knowledge are hidden, and therefore we are to call to walk in him and be built up in him because we've been filled by him. But Paul, he, he kind of continues in this idea, and he continues to talk about the benefits of being captivated by Christ in verse 11. Look at this. He says, You were also circumcised in him with a circumcision not done with hands by putting off the body of flesh in the circumcision of Christ. When you were buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. By the way, I'm going to have to thank Pastor Joe and Pastor Stefan for giving me a, a, some verses about circumcision. I mean, this is like, yeah, I love preaching about that, right? But <laughs> now, Paul is saying, though, he's not, he's not saying this is a, a literal uh, circumcision here because he says it's a circumcision not done by hands. Okay, this is a work of God that's being done here. And it's, and it's a metaphor, he's using a metaphor for death here. And that those in Christ have died in the circumcision of Christ or in the death of Christ. Meaning that in Christ's death and his putting off of his body flesh, the body of flesh, that believers die. They were circumcised. And Romans, the book of Romans, says that when Jesus died, our old self was crucified. That when he died, we died. And although it's not kind of explicitly stated here, I think the underlying tone is, is there was an atonement, right? He, he paid the price for us. He died in our place. So when he died, we die. And this work that was done was not done by human hands, but it was a will of God. It was done by the work of God. And in Christ's death, we, we share in that fully and completely and have indeed been buried with him. You know, I, I don't know. It's, some of the commentators were disagreeing with this a little bit, but there's also this a potential picture of baptism here, of an actual baptism, where when we go down into the waters, we are buried in the likeness of his death, and then as we come out of the waters, we are raised in the likeness of his resurrection. So there's possibly that going on as well here. But he continues this idea of sharing in Christ's death and resurrection in verse 13. He says, And when you were dead in trespasses and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive with him and forgave us all our trespasses. He erased the certificate of debt with its obligations that was against us and opposed to us and has taken away by nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and disgraced them publicly. He triumphed over them in him. This is the good news, folks, that Christ's death, or the good news did not just stop with Christ's death. It also includes his resurrection and, and his ascension. He is alive and he's alive indeed. And he makes us alive. He gives a new life in him. And he has forgiven us of our sins and our trespasses because of what he has done on the cross. He has nailed it to the cross and he has left it there. And once we were, where we were hostile to God, we were alienated from him as we had read about uh, several weeks back. Our trespasses have been forgiven and we're now considered children of God. And the forgiveness of our trespasses was accomplished by him erasing our debt. Think about the significance of that for a moment. I don't know how many of you have owned your own homes. Maybe you've taken out student loans or maybe you even purchased something on your credit cards at one point that was maybe above and beyond, but maybe you had to do it. Think about debt. Our houses, you know, we pay these over 30 years, right? 10 years, I think, for student loans, maybe longer. But think about this for a moment. What would it mean if you took out a loan that you could never pay back? You go out, and some bank, for some reason, they lend you $20 million. You buy that dream home. You'll never be able to pay that back. I mean, I, maybe you will. I, I can't pay that back. $20 million home. You sign the documents. You get the keys. You know that never in your lifetime will you ever be able to pay that mortgage off. 
And then someone comes along and they just put it right there on the bank's table. $20 million. Think about that. God, he holds the debt of our life in his hands. And he just cancels it. And he canceled it by nailing it to a tree. And indeed, Christ is above all, church. He, he disarmed the rulers and authorities, and therefore, who can stand against him? He has stripped away the rulers and their authorities and, and their powers, and he has put them to shame. He has canceled our debt. He has triumphed over all. They are nothing but a joke. They are utterly helpless, and Christ rules over all. You see, when the philosophies of this world, when they try to take us captive, he puts them to shame. <laughs> he indeed has victory over all. And there's no power, there's no superpower in the entire world that could, could contend with Christ. Nothing which can separate us from the love of God and his only begotten Son. And so that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. And I just want you to consider for the rest of our service today, consider who Christ is. Consider what he has done for you. Consider in him how you are filled to see to it that nothing nor no one takes you captive but that you consider all things in light of Christ. Let me pray for us. Oh, Father God, I'm just I'm overcome with emotion, Lord, just thinking about the debt that you paid on my behalf. What an amazing feat indeed, Lord. And it was above $20 million for me. Something I could never pay back, Lord, on my own. And just like you've done for all these people here, Lord, that it is a debt that they could never cancel, they, they could never pay back on their own, Father God. And yet you, Lord, you have canceled their debt. You are indeed above all, Lord. And for that reason alone, you are our cornerstone. You are our foundation which upon we build everything else. Our church should be built on you, Lord, and nothing else. Our ministries, our outreach, whatever it is we do, Lord, I pray that we build it on you. We don't build it on what someone else says. We don't buy some kind of program that says, you know, how to build a church, how to get people here. No, Lord, we base our foundation on Christ. You are indeed good. You are indeed over all, Lord. I thank you so much, Father God. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.